music to our nation and our collective responsibility to create a more just future. I am so very pleased and happy to welcome to this conversation today, my fellow Episcopalian and colleague at the Washington National Cathedral, Pulitzer Prize winning writer and historic historian John Meacham. Mr. Meacham is the author of multiple New York Times bestsellers, including The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels. And he is also a Pulitzer Prize winning writer and historian. He is a distinguished visiting professor at Vanderbilt University and co-chair of Vanderbilt's project on unity in American democracy. He's a contributing writer for the New York Times Book Review and a fellow of the Society of American Historians. And I could go on and on. But I want to thank you, Mr. Meacham, for joining me in this conversation today. Well, thank you, Canon. Uh, blessedly, you don't have to go on and on. Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's good. No, I could. Uh, I'm, I'm lowering, I want everyone to know I'm lowering the theological IQ of this conversation by joining it. So, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. And I should say he is humble because you are not. Well, I'm going to jump right in because there's a lot in this day and age yeah. that I want to cover. And first, let me begin here that perhaps it's fortuitous that we are having this conversation on this July 19th day. For as you know, it was on this day in 1848 that the first Women's Rights Convention opened in Seneca Falls, New York, where the women drafted a resolution modeled after the Declaration of Independence called the Declaration of Sentiments, demanding equality and suffrage for women. Now here we are, some 172 years later, with an equal rights amendment that has not yet been ratified and with a Dobbs decision, which for many signals the erosion of women's rights. Mm -hmm. What does this suggest to us about our democracy? Are we moving forward and growing into the democracy we claim to be or not? Well, a lot of, def lot of definitions beg to be made there. Uh, you introduced this with the question of how do we become a more just society. It is true that the, it's true, however, that the constitutional mission is not about being more just, mm -hmm. is about being a more perfect union, right. which is an, an inherently more limited enterprise, right. right? So that is to say that if you believe that democracy is the only means to justice, then you are unhappy with democracy. But this is not a case, it seems to me, in human affairs where we can let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Uh, in 1854, William Lloyd, one of the great programs of all time, can you imagine being at this event? William Lloyd Garrison, Sojourner Truth, and Henry David Thoreau all spoke. That's a, that's a ticket, right? <laughs> I'd, pay a lot of, I'd pay a lot of money for that. And at that event in Massachusetts on July 4th, 1854, William Lloyd Garrison burned a copy of the Constitution and one of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, which basically did away with due process for escaped enslaved persons, and said it, the Constitution was a covenant with death and an agreement with hell, and that true abolitionists should no longer be part of the constitutional structure in terms of politics that it was to essentially to be part of it was to be a collaborator in a 20th century term. The person who disagreed with that, that I find so fascinating was Frederick Douglass, who argued that there is no soil more conducive to the growth of reform than American soil. And that may well be true. What can also be true is that it does, it's not, the soil is not as rich as we wish, right? And so I think that this is arguably the bleakest hour of, for American democracy since Fort Sumter. I believe that uh, for all sorts of reasons that are intuitive to us at this point. The question I fall back on again and again, from a historical point of view, because that, that's all I got, is what do we do instead? Right? And I worry all the time that the center and the left in American politics 
is being asked, I'm gonna wander into your zip code here, is being asked to be so particularly tolerant, patient, forbearing, and virtuous. All right, the center and the left are being asked to let the prodigal come, come home. Sure. The one sheep, you know, the center and the left are the 99, but the one is coming back and everybody's supposed to rejoice over that. We are called to do that by scripture, reason, and tradition. But as you and I have never talked about this, but my view is that if you have to tell a parable or give a commandment about something, it means people aren't doing it then. <laughs> right? right. You, you don't command love, your, love thy neighbor if everybody's loving their neighbor. So it's a particularly fraught moment in terms of what those of us, and I'm, I'm in that center, center left world, what are we called to do? And are we able to meet this incredibly difficult test, which is to be forbearing in the face of anti-democratic, unjust forces? And in that sense, I think this is, I think we're in the beginning. I don't know if we're at the beginning or in the middle of that story, but I know we're not at the end. So I want to get back to that in a minute of what we are to do and sort of what we are to become. But I want to pick up on something you said here, and that is that our constitution is more limited than mm -hmm. sort of aspiring toward this democracy. But our constitution is about protecting the union and perhaps a more perfect union. So I might, I agree with that. And what happens because our constitution itself- There's usually a but after you say you agree with it. Is there a yeah, but coming? You, you know there's a but <laughs> because I agree with it in the sense that what happens when that union is defined in such a way that it excludes. And so the constitution sure. itself we know doesn't include, which is why the ERA is so important mm -hmm. uh, to be ratified. It doesn't include gender and, and protecting the rights of, of women. It doesn't include really race. It talks about slavery. Uh, uh, and so when, when that union itself mm -hmm. is not inclusive, people are fighting, you will, for to, well, we know the language of make America great again, to take America back to what America is supposed to be. Yeah. If the basis of that is the Constitution, then we're talking in so many respects of about a union that perhaps at its foundation, and I like mm -hmm. to argue it is at its foundation, is white supremacist, right? Uh, to, is limiting. So what do we do with that? It's a human construct because a democracy is the fullest expression of all of us. And this does get into your bailiwick. I think this is fundamentally a theological question. A democracy is the fullest manifestation of all of our dispositions of heart and mind. And what the American experiment shows us is that inclusion and progress are possible, but Jesus, God, it takes a long time. And it's always fraught and vulnerable. That progress is always fraught and vulnerable. And I understand, look, I am a boringly heterosexual white Southern male Episcopalian, right? Things work out for me in this country. That's right. They just do. I'm a big believer to go back to your big guy, you know, the, the, the big character in the New Testament, that to whom much is given, much is expected. And so I think that there was an ideal articulated at the beginning. It was part of a several centuries uh, movement in uh, Western life that began with, in some ways, with Gutenberg and the introduction of type and the democratiza democratization of information. Uh, but also the enlightenment created this scientific racist category uh, vernacular. And it was in many ways, the demand for enslaved labor in the new world was such that as Samuel Johnson said, why do we hear the loudest yelps for liberty from the drivers of Negroes? Right. No one's ever really doubted 
that there was hypocrisy at the heart of the American drama. And I don't see how you can doubt it because hypocrisy is at the heart of just about everybody I know, not you, of course, but, you know, other people, all right, other fallen sinners. So my view is not a rah-rah one about the union or the Constitution. It is about, if not this, then what? And the 14th Amendment was uh, certified in this time frame as well, um, which, of course, was the basis of Brown v. Board. But that was in 1954, right? So the 14th Amendment comes in 1868, and then in 1954, they get round to it. And in 1896, in Plessy v. Ferguson, the Supreme Court declared separate but equal, it was, was constitutional. The history of the United States is one of fits and starts toward doing the right thing, rethinking it almost the instant it happens, and then sitting with the possibilities of a changing country and deciding whether one wants to pursue that. And I would argue, you know, there's this big debate, as you know well, about was it 1619 or 1776? My view is that the America we're dealing with was founded in 1965 with the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act, with the Immigration Act, with the movement toward Title IX and the ERA, as, as you've articulated, the founding of the National Organization for Women, you know, the, the work of Seneca Falls unfolding. And so we're about 55 years old. And the backlash to those steps was almost immediate. My favorite story about this is Lyndon Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act after a 67 day filibuster in 1964. Extraordinary political courage, extraordinary thing to do in an election year. Three minutes later, he bars an integrated delegation from Mississippi from going to the Democratic National Convention in Atlantic City. And John Lewis would say, that the, the way the Democratic Party treated the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in August 1964 in Atlantic City was the most depressing moment of the civil rights movement. He included in that the murders in Neshoba County, the Birmingham uh, bombing, church bombing. And the reason it loomed so large for him was that for that brief moment in the summer of 1964, it looked as though the union could be perfected. But then we fell off the wagon again. My only view here is fundamentally democracy, constitutional democracy as we understand it, is a moral undertaking in the raw sense of the word moral. Moral, as you know, is it's custom. It's how are we with each other? Mm -hmm. And if we do not see each other as neighbors worthy of respect, then it's not a democracy. It's a Hobbesian war of all against all. So what happens? Well, a couple of things here. One, you say that the nation that we're sort of quote unquote striving to become began in 1965 with the Civil Rights Act, the Immigration Act, which uh, sort of repealed uh, the Johnson-Reed Act of what, 1924, that set quotas on immigrants. But here we are again, fighting uh, that battle. Yep. We see that the 1965 Voting Rights Act was practically eviscerated. Here we are again, fighting that battle. We know, as, as you've said, that every time, and if we measure this by Black progress, any time Black people have moved a little bit closer to freedom, there has been retrenchment, a, yep. a, a response. So it's no accident that we would get a mega America in response to uh, uh, Barack Obama's presidency, right? As uh, W.E.B. Du Bois says, look for a moment in the sun and then right back toward slavery. Now, this is, you might call the battle of the soul between our better angels and our worst selves. Or is it 
really a nation trying to figure out who it really wants to be and really figure out its identity. And because at the foundation of our identity, this nation with the city on the hill was to be an Anglo-Saxon nation. Mm -hmm. And so are we always, this is what John Winthrop said, Thomas Jefferson was a thoroughgoing Anglo-Saxonist. Are we always now lurching is the war or warring soda ball again from W.E.B. Du Bois, a warring identity? Who do we want to be? Do we want to be that Anglo-Saxon nation, read white nation, or do we really want to be this nation where there's freedom and justice and for all? I don't think the I don't think the two uh, forces you put up are in conflict. Uh, honestly, I think yes. My formulation is that the country has a soul. Uh, it, in Hebrew and Greek, soul means breath or life. Uh, so there's an essence. I believe that, like a human soul, there is a battle between good and evil, light and dark, kindness, cruelty, grace, rage, uh, better angels, worse instincts. And so I, I don't see that that's in conflict with struggling to become the kind of, some kind of nation. Um, I would just argue that that's the individual drama cast on a larger, in a larger context. And I don't know who's gonna win. Uh, no one does. There is some reason to hope and there's a lot of reason to fear. But I don't know what else, to use an Augustinian metaphor, um, you're the only person on the planet, maybe I can just say that with casually, um, <laughs> is it's a journey, right? It's, 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 it's this pilgrimage. And I know where I want it to go. I know where you want it to go. And I know where a lot of folks who I'm sitting in Nashville, Tennessee, where a lot of people within 30 miles of me want it to go. And that ain't the same place. Right. That's right. You but that's said. it. Right. That's the yeah. drama. And also you can't. Democracy cannot be a synonym for what you want. Or what I want. Mm -hmm. Right. Democracy is the rule of the many. And you and I know a lot of people that we wouldn't want ruling. But that's but because we have a vote and a voice, you can't, and that, that's my view on voting rights, you can't take away theirs. Demog you know, the First Amendment doesn't just apply to people we agree with. And so I would argue that in this moment where we talk about the future of democracy, a more precise, dorkier, and less eloquent way of putting it, what we're really talking about is, to use your term, it's the future of the rule of law and the pursuit of equal justice. And sometimes democracy serves those ends and sometimes it doesn't. That's, that doesn't sound very hopeful in <laughs> uh, writers, but you, let's talk about the rule of the many. Yeah. Uh, and the hopes of the many, because you have said that Progress in America, and I, and I quote you now, doesn't begin at the top among the few, but from the bottom and among the many. You've said that it comes when the whispered hopes of those outside the mainstream rise in volume to reach the ears and hearts and minds of the powerful, to, uh, to quote it's you. It's pretty good, yeah. <laughs> but now I have I to agree. tell you, you know there's always a but. I have to tell you, when I read that, I said this. I said, now only a white heterosexual male, as boringly you Boringly heterosexual, boringly heterosexual. Right, an Episcopalian can say that and believe that. Because I got it. That's not tell true, you. Canon. That's not well, true. Oh, I got it. You tell don't believe you, that? By you don't that, believe that sentence? No, because Progress, I got. Wait, wait, wait. Read the sentence again. Progress and change come in the United States when? Right. Now, I do believe that it, it, it are the people that are on the outside that have to be the impetus for that. Right. But you say when it re when those 
people outside the mainstream reach the hearts and minds uh, of those in power. Now, when their hopes, their whispered hopes rise in volume, brown and black folks and LGBTQ folks have screamed our hopes for years. And they seem to be falling on deaf ears, hardened hearts and closed minds. So we continue to have this move a little bit, stay in the sun for a minute. And then we get pushed right back towards slavery. So that's what I mean when I say, oh, I don't know. Only, uh, uh, only someone that's not brown and black yeah. and is a white male can say that. Well, as a white male, I did say it. And I believe <laughs> it as a historical observation which is that that's when progress and change come. You, you and I actually aren't disagree. Uh, you're, you're, I'm not saying that's a good thing, <laughs> right? Does it say it's a good thing? But that is a historical fact that abolition came as well as with the deaths of 750,000 people, um, civil rights, all the all the rights that were not included and embraced as they should have been in the beginning, those moments where there was progress and something to give the folks you're talking about some reason to endure, it happened because of their witness, their courage, convincing those who had the power to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't see, if you could lay out another scenario by which things happen, go for it. But it is clear to me that very, almost no American president or American Congress has woken up one morning and said, we're gonna go right a bunch of wrongs because it's the right thing to do. That's right. Okay. So your quarrel is not with me your quarrel is with human appetite and ambition. And I, again, would argue that's why this is a moral as well as a legal and constitutional question. So, again, I'm, 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 I try to be somewhat pragmatic on this. Um, I don't know what it looks like if the what I meant by that sentence, if that is not true, if it's not true, then we are a hopelessly uh, irreparable oligarchy. Mm -hmm. And you may believe that. I don't think so because you wouldn't be talking to me and you wouldn't be doing what you do. So you believe, let me, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that justice can come in the American context, as you and I are part of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I believe in the justice of God. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm not sure when I look out on the American context, and I'll, get, get, I'll turn this into question and get you out of here uh, on this as we could no, go. No, this is on. fun. No, no, no. I haven't been attacked <laughs> like this in years. <laughs> being attacked come on you you talk about even in your own work the give and take and the complexity of the eternal struggle uh as you put it and a part of that eternal struggle is to engage in the uncomfortable right totally. and to even live in the uncomfortable so so let me let me then turn it here and get you out to live in the uncomfortable and that eternal struggle and to understand if we are going to progress and, and if we are going to move to that more just society, you have said that we've got to understand the struggle and that it is an eternal struggle and perhaps to live in that struggle and understand our history. What happens when that history that, that has shaped us and that continues to shape the struggle is under attack as it is today? Then what is the role of the historian in when that history is being attacked? A lot of my historian friends will disagree with what I'm about to say. But I, this is one person's opinion. I think that there is, to use your terminology, your crafts terminology, I think there is a prophetic role to play. 
And I think that in part because I just noticed this with my own, my own children who are range in age from 14 to 20, their lived experience would give them almost no confidence that the United States can make the kinds of the kind of progress we're talking about. Right? They were born after the turn of the century. Uh, there's the brief moment of, of President Obama's presidency, but it had its own complications uh, and unfulfilled promises, um, as we all do. Uh, but their central narrative of their lived experience is Donald Trump and the storming of the United States Capitol. And so why would they think that there's a capacity, that Douglas was right, that there's a capacity for reform, that there is soil out of which reform can grow? So you know this, this is what you do. This is your, your mission uh, in quite explicit terms. You preach a gospel in the hopes that there is a living word that can shift hearts, minds, hands, etc. I think historians have a particular obligation. I think all of us do. I think it's an obligation of citizenship to tell a story that illuminates the path we would like the country to take. That is not to say that you manipulate facts. It's not to say any of that. I'm not, you know, we're in, in context here, what we're talking about is if you come to a, as I have done, if you come to a view of the world, a view of the country that you believe is more true than not, then I think there is an obligation, a moral obligation to tell that story. And I don't, the story I tried to tell in the book you were quoting from was not one of my friend, Eddie Gloud and I uh, disagree about this all the time, um, but I make him then give me good cigars. So it's okay. Uh, <laughs> I probably shouldn't reveal that, but, but Eddie and I have this debate all the time and he, it's, you all are, the, the, the questions you're asking are in sync with, with the Glaudian critique of me, uh, as I call it, um, is that any progress should be a matter for self-congratulation and as kind of cultural Zoloft for people like me. I understand that. I, get, I take us back to where we started. We're dealing with a human, not a clinical enterprise. We're dealing with 330 million people who, some of whom believe X and some believe Y. Do I wish that they be, that a preponderance of those folks began with a different view? Yes, but that's not the reality that providence has given us. What God has done in history is given us, you and I, a moment where our work is unfolding in a moment, to use your term, of retrenchment and reaction. Did it take too long to get to the action that led to the reaction? Of course it did. Are, is the work ahead of us almost mind-bogglingly difficult? Absolutely. But I don't see the alternative except to say and this is what I believe about the, the, the point of that argument that I made in, in, in the soul book is strife is perennial. And you are remembered for what you do in hours of strife. So do you want to be on the right side or the wrong side? Do you want to be John Lewis or do you want to be the Alabama troopers? I know which I want to be. And you and I have a lot of co-religionists who have a very different understanding of the application of the gospel. That's exactly right. And of the sacred history of, of ancient Israel forward. And so I think the historian's role, like a theologian's role, is to tell the story honestly, 
but with an open heart that says, let's let the next generation tell a story of us that is more ennobling than constricting. There's much that we could say and continue, and I hope this conversation will continue, and I know it will, uh, with you and me. I thank you for your work. I thank you for this conversation, your insights, and your fruit for thought. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank Ken, you, Canon. And you. Let's, let's do it again. These, these, the questions you're asking are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think that, and I know you, the, your, your audience and, and, and your constituency are people who are struggling with the most fundamental of questions, which is, is it worth the fight? And, and I continue to say yes, but I know why some people think not. You know, struggling with that question of hope and is that a hope that can be found yeah. within this struggling democracy? We will continue this conversation Thank you, my fellow canon historian. <laughs> I was going to wear my cassock, but I couldn't find it. All right, and we will continue this conversation. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, as I will end where you uh, actually ended, I do believe that we must continue the fight and keep on.